As usual. Who are you talking to? Not you, David. You don't look black. So. You, could, you could have put it on. You could have. What percentage was it? Four point six one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it is twelve oh five p.m. and um, just wanted to get this party started. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Dubon. I am the Student Government Association Advisor here at Bronx Community College. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm just gonna go over briefly the engagement rules for this uh, afternoon's event, and then I'll pass it on to our Student Government Association uh, legal legislator and president. So for, today's after for this afternoon's event, Please remain muted. You all will are entering muted. Please remain muted until the question and answer portion, which is at the end of the event. If you have any questions during, during the panel discussion, please submit your questions in the chat. You can um, submit it to everyone. So then this way we do not have any duplicate questions. And uh, our president, our SGA president, Priscilla Tocor and Gabriel Morillo will be taking um, your questions and compiling them to then ask the panelists at the end of, uh, of the discussion. Um, if you are here for a class or um, if you haven't gotten in contact with your faculty member, make sure that you get in contact with your faculty member if you're here for extra credit on behalf of a class. Without further ado, I would like to pass this on to uh, our SGA legal Le executive legal legislator Gabriel Morillo and our president, uh, Madam Priscilla Tocor. Thank you so much, Ms. Tiffany. Meeting students, faculty, and guests. My name is Priscilla Tocor. I am the student government president of Bronx Community College. On behalf of the Student Government Association, I want to say a big thank you to all of you for showing up to our Black Lives Matter event, an issue of national importance. I will also use this opportunity to thank our legal legislator, Gabriel Morello, for working tirelessly to make this event a success. So over to you, Gabriel Morello. Thank you. Thank you, Mad thank you very much, Madam President Decor. And thanks to all for attending this very important Black Lives Matter panel discussion. Now, I want to invite the Bronx Community College President Dr. Thomas Seganegbi to say a few words. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really, 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 you've all made my day by looking at the Hollywood squares and all of the mosaic on the screen here, really. You know, in this time, we are craving to meet people socially. Thank God for Zoom that we're able to do this this afternoon here. You know, what, what, a, what a nice event and program to put on. Gabriel, Madam President uh, Priscilla, I want to say thank you to all of the students for really organizing this. When Gabriel called me a couple of weeks ago and told me about this program, the question I asked, why not? He was, as he was asking me, should we do this? I said, oh, why not? We should, we should go ahead and, and do it, really, because it's very, very important. Black Lives Matter to me, matters to all of us in this country where we live, where people are discriminated against on the basis of their skin, on the basis of their gender. What a time to really talk about it so that we all develop the awareness for it. I want to say to the students here, really, thank you. I see our councilwoman, Vanessa Gibson, our, our lovely councilwoman. I want to say thank you for all that you do for our BCC. On behalf of the students, I want to say thank you for your care, for your concern, for all that you do, not just for us in your, in, in your district, but for all of our entire city. Welcome, and we appreciate you joining us this afternoon here. Darren, I, I, I want to say thank you again for agreeing to moderate this program this afternoon here. You are I already said I'm going to adopt you as the honorary Bronco and as your honorary BCC family member. So, so thank you. To the students that we have this afternoon here, really, this is a wonderful moment, wonderful learning opportunity for all of us and for all of you in particular. I hope at the end of the day, you have opportunity to ask questions. We just went through an historic election, as our president elect would say, to fight for the soul of our nation. I'm so happy that the result came out. I mean, to really show that good only always prevail over evil. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a really good result. But I think it won't have been possible if we are, all of us were not involved in making sure that people register, in making sure that people vote, in making sure that people actually ask our friends and family members to go vote. I think really one of the lessons I take away from the election is that your, our voices do matter and our voices do count. 
who will have told me that Georgia will be flipped in, in this election here? So these are things that really show that if we all develop the awareness and if we all work together here, we can move mountains and we can do good things together. So Gabriel, thank you again, Madam President. Thank you for, for this event and to all of the students and faculty. Welcome, and I'm looking forward to, to active participation this afternoon. Thank you. Gabriel. Well, thank you for thank you for those kind words, President Sikinegbe. Without further ado, I would like to welcome the host of BronxNet's popular talk show open, today's moderator and good friend of Bronx Community College, Darren Jamie. Thank you, and I'm glad to be with you and to also to Dr. Sekinegbe uh, for the warm introduction. Uh, Priscilla Gabriel, Ramona, Richard, thank you so much in the BCC family. I'm glad to just be with you and share. Uh, of course, we here at BronxNet uh, continue to support all the great work that BCC does. And for me personally, just to have the opportunity to be able to share uh, in this important conversation, not just as a journalist, um, but as a black man myself, uh, who's actually living and breathing and a part of the fabric of this community and this nation. And uh, so to have this conversation, to have this discussion, and to be a part of uh, this dialogue is really special to me. So thank you for inviting me and allowing me to be a part of the discussion. So without any further ado, uh, we want to get into our panel and talk a little about Black Lives Matter and what that particularly means. And so we want to join, uh, we're pleased to be joined by our panelists uh, and our guest panelists are number one, we've got Clifford L. Marshall II. He's the director of the Male Empowerment Network. And then also we've got Shermika Pierce, who's the interorganization organizational council manager of the Office of Student Life. And then also Senator Kenneth Flowers, who's a senator in the Student Government Association. And then also we've got council member Vanessa L. Gibson of the 16th Council Matic District uh, in the borough of the Bronx and does some great work in New York City. Uh, just got finished talking to her yesterday and now to have the opportunity to talk to her uh, again today. So I guess I will begin with the Honorable Councilwoman first. When we have this conversation talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, I'll ask you first, Council, uh, Council Member Gibson, when we talk about the term Black Lives Matter, tell me what it actually means to you uh, personally. Thank you so much, Darren, and thank you to the BCC family, to the student government, to fellow elected officials, students, advocates. It's good to see you, David, and Dr. Sekonek, me. Thank you so much. You know BCC is my heart. I love the amazing work you do every day. Not only am I your neighbor, but certainly a friend, and I appreciate you having this important discussion today really on Black Lives Matter, but how do we move forward as a community, as a city, as a society, as a country? And I, like all of you, I'm excited about new leadership in the White House. I think I did a praise dance. I jumped for joy. I just thank God for new leadership at a critical time in this country. And when you hear the term and understand that this term is a movement, Black Lives Matter, for me, as an African-American woman, it means affirming that my life matters. Just like all lives should matter, I don't think you can say that confidently until Black Lives Matter. And sadly, what we've seen in America across the country, far too many African-American men and women who have been assaulted and brutalized and unfortunately died in police custody by police violence. And it has been sad when you hear the names, when you speak these names, when you see the hashtags, when I look at a sister like Breonna Taylor, or a brother like Eric Garner, or so many, the names continue to be added to this horrible list. It is a sad reality sometimes when people believe that being Black in America should not be a death sentence. And although we can speak about the great work that NYPD does right in New York City, but we know that law enforcement across the country has to be modernized. It has to reflect the diversity of America. We have to look at recruitment and you know look at cultural sensitivity. But we also have to make sure that we don't rely on police for everything in our society. They are not the fixers of everything. And we have to look at redefining public safety from the perspective of being Black in America and being Black here in the city of New York. So for me, like you, Darren, this is personal. Um, I am a woman of color, my brother, my family, African-American men 
And so it is very personal when you can relate to someone who's lost their life to police violence. Yeah. Before I let you go, because I know you're on a tight schedule, I want to also ask you the question, what advice do you give to students about raising their voice, right? We're talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about not just protesting, but honestly uh, doing strategy and, 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 and taking affirmative action. What advice do you give students about being engaged in the movement? I say to all students that you are a part of the solution. You are not a part of the problem. Don't let anyone ever belittle you and think that your voice is not powerful and influential. You have something to give back to this world. And no matter what circumstance you may find yourself in, it doesn't define your future. And it certainly doesn't define who you are as a person. We have to hold our heads up high and be proud of our heritage, celebrating our African-American and Latino heritage. It is who we are. It is our foundation. And a lot of movements in society, like Black Lives Matter, climate change, you know, everything you've seen in modern society has been led by people, not politicians. So you all are the drivers of change. You are the agents of change that we need. And what has to happen? Because demonstrating without a plan is counterproductive. We can go out and lay ourselves in front of City Hall, in front of BCC, the concourse. We can do all of that, but we have to have a plan. There always has to be a plan in what we do. So what are we going to do to change laws, to change policy, to change the way NYPD does work, to redefine public safety, to engage anti-gun violence, crisis management system, to look at this from a larger perspective in what young people need. Look at the underlying root causes of why youth engage in violence in the first place, because they live in poverty, they don't have jobs, they're in domestic situations, they can't find work. They can't get into school, right? They have a record. They've been incarcerated. All of these things that inhibit our growth. Don't let it define you. And so we have to have a plan. We have to strategize. We have to mobilize. We have to be united and realize that this is not Black versus Latino. This is all of us together. Whether you're Latino, Garifuna, African, African American, Caribbean American, we are all in this together. And we either sink together or we can swim together. So there has to be a movement. There has to be changes around policy. And then also the budget. That's why you saw the defund NYPD movement because of the effort of young people to shift a billion dollars in funding into social service programs. You may often wonder, Darren, you probably asked the question too. Why are there more school safety agents in New York City public schools than there are social workers and guidance counselors combined. It says that we care more about law enforcement than we do about the social emotional needs of our kids. That's what has to change. And I love school safety. They're majority black women. Those are my sisters. I love them, but they are a part of the solution, not the only solution. And so we have to constantly push and push elected officials and government to do better and really represent the interests. Now, again, it's really hard to find a balance, guys, because I want you to understand for us in the Bronx, we struggle with crime, we struggle with violence, we have gun violence, we have mothers who have lost their children, we have all of these things. And so how do you tell residents in your community that you support the police, but then at the end of the day, you have to find ways to hold everybody accountable, right? These issues are not mutually exclusive. You can support police reform, but you can also support the work of cops of everyday men and women that come to work with an, a commitment to do work, not a commitment to choke someone to death, right? No one wakes up and says that I want to use excessive force today, but we understand that things happen. Race in America is a topic we will talk about until we die, but we have to find a way within government, within the atmosphere in which we are working and going to school to offer up policy changes budget you know recommendations and we have to find a way i always say redefine public safety what does that look like from a holistic perspective right is it a health care issue it's not just a policing law enforcement problem but it's a health care issue we are facing mental health issues therapeutic services we need all of these different things and so i look at all of that and i share with all of you as students you have a voice and you have fellow classmates that are following you and they're looking to you for leadership. No matter what title you have in front of your name, if you're the president, be the very best president you can. 
but don't sit on a pedestal and not surround yourself with the team because you can't do it by yourself. So you need a team, you need to be a coalition builder and you have to listen to others. We don't always have the answer, right, Darren? We don't always have the answer. That's right. You have to surround yourself with people that can help you be a better public servant, a better student, a better leader, right? Coalesce around folks that share your ideals, that share your values. We may not all have the answer on how to get there, but we know what we want to get to, right? We know what that vision is. We know what that plan is. So all we have to do is sometimes put our differences aside and sometimes put our egos aside and come together and say, this is what we want to do and how can we get there? And so I look forward, I'll try to stay on as long as I can to this conversation because I really want to hear from young people. You guys are the next generation. I'm out of the council next year. I'm moving on to bigger things. And I really do appreciate all of you and all of your efforts and know that you have a supporter in me. Yeah, thank you. Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson sharing with us and hang out as long as you can hang out with us uh -huh. uh, and, and, we'll, and we'll have this conversation. Um, I want to also take the time right now to bring in uh, a local politician, Senator Kenneth Flowers. He's the senator in the Student Government Association. And so I want to talk to him for a minute because uh, representing student government, uh, we understand that Black Lives Matter is this huge movement. And as we talk about this huge movement, um, there's a lot of things attached with Black Lives Matter. Many times people say, oh, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, oh, it's just about criminal justice, it's about stopping police. And we know that that's a, a part of it. But there's so much more to Black Lives Matter and the policies and the initiatives. So talk to me a little bit about, for you, um, is there a specific issue for you that you feel like really needs to ring out, that we really need to be paying attention to in this climate attached to Black Lives Matter? Thank you. Thank you for actually me to be a panelist uh, since legislative senior uh, Marillo. Thank everyone. I'm glad to be here today. And um, I'm a man of few words sometimes, but your question, what do I think? Communities and institutions, we have to do a better job now of reaching out because I'm more affected today by the younger generation that I am supposed to lead. I'll give you a short story, and this is a very short story about going to work one day and just moving into an apartment building and meeting a young man who helped me move in. So I became attached to him a little bit, you know. So when I saw that he was putting his book bag under the steps and telling his mother he was going to school and he wasn't. So when I approached him, and told him that he needed to go to school. He looked up to me as like I was his big brother. So that made me feel good that he went to school that day, but he didn't do it the next day. So I even gave him some money to, because I find out one of the reasons why he didn't want to go to, because just like the, the uh, young lady said, that we, we're living in a world where people are living in poverty that they can't even buy themselves or their mother can't even give their children money for lunch. And that was one of the things that made them feel bad about going to school. So, you know, I would give him lunch money, but it all starts with him walking past that first corner. And that first corner is where everything would change for him because some of his friends are going to school and some of his friends are hanging out on the corner. So I think that in these communities and that we have to do a much better job of getting them off the corners. And I hope this is answering your question, but that's my feelings today because it hurts me so bad when I think about my youth as growing up. I didn't grow up in a ordinary neighborhood, just put it like that. I would tell you, I was a product of affirmative action. So my family was just fortunate to be able to live in a middle class neighborhood. And from that incident, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have friends of my color. I had to go to their neighborhood. And so it was very tough for me living among, as you can put it today, people of colors, uh, Jews, whites, uh, German. And that was something back there because, you know, we just had a civil war. Now you was dealing with Vietnam and a lot of, a lot of kids, they were going to be off to Vietnam, but I had to live in that environment that people would close their curtain when I walk by or tell their children to come in the house. And uh, I don't see that 
that love today like I saw back then when families and communities, when I went outside that community, got together. You know, there was a movement back then, the civil rights movement, and then I was just a little too young, but I remember everything that went on. And to tell you the difference between what happened to me then was that when the death of a politician, uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, that community that I lived in that closed the curtain on me and wouldn't let me play with their little kids actually began to speak to me because they felt the pain, the pain of racism in this country. But to get back to what I'm saying, as a young child, I'll never forget sitting on the corner with no friends at all, black, white, Puerto Rican, and uh, having someone come up to me and ask me, how you feeling today? That I knew closed the curtain on me one time. That I knew told his son, come on in the house, don't play with him, he's not your kind. So we came a long way from that. But now the corners are filled with drugs the corners are filled with young kids toting the guns. You know, we have to start there in that community, I think, and try to make it better for them because not everybody is, uh, you know, want to go to school. But we've got to find a way to get them in there. we got to find a way to reach out to them. we got to do for the community. And I think it starts there first that we want to talk about Black Lives Matter, Latinos and everything. we got to start in the community where the poverty is the greatest. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Parker. Uh, I want to bring in Shamika to talk a little bit to us right now. She's the Inter-Organizational Council Manager for the Office of Student Life. And uh, Shamika, when we talk about Black Lives Matter and we say Black Lives Matter, what does it mean to you personally as a Black woman? Um, well, um, I grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, I would say I was a little bit sheltered um, because all I seen was faces that looked exactly like mine. I grew up in church with a really strong religious background. It wasn't until I moved out of the out of Brooklyn or I, I spent a little time in, in, in the system in foster care and I had the opportunity to go to a school in a predominantly white neighborhood. And so being 13, 14 years old, going to school far away from home, we were bused to school. And I remember lunchtime, they had to actually stop us from going out um, for lunch because a lot of the, the black boys from my school would get into fights with the Italians and, and other um, Caucasian students in the neighborhood. They didn't really want us there. Still at 13, 14 years old, I really didn't get a, a good grasp on Racial, you know, I heard about it. I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King. I learned about the struggles of the 50s and the 60s. My parents grew up during that time, but I really didn't get to grasp it until I moved out of Brooklyn and I moved to other places and I actually started seeing things happen, especially when I moved to the Bronx. Um, I, I, I haven't seen so much death in my life until I moved to the Bronx. Um, one of the first one of the first situations I heard about was um, a young boy, Anthony Baez, being choked. I actually live right down the street from the street that was named after him, and he was choked um, by a police officer because his ball. They were playing ball in the street, and his ball hit the police officer's car. So that young man lost his life um, because he was playing ball in the streets. A parent had to bury their child. Today, I am a parent. I have two sons. And I think really Black Lives Matter really took an effect for me um, when Trayvon Martin was killed. That's when I really started wanting to be a part of this, this movement. Um, I remember we had this big thing at, on campus at BCC, and I actually came out to speak because I, my youngest son name is Trayvon, so it really kind of touched home for me. And my sons were teenagers and they were going to high school here in the Bronx. And I remember telling them, listen, you know, I have very good kids. They both graduated from high school, but I remember having to tell my two sons, listen, 
go straight to school and come straight home because you fit the description right now. And that was hard for me as a mom to tell my two sons, you fit the description right now. Come straight home. Don't hang out in the building. Come straight upstairs. Call me when you get in because I was at BCC working on my associate's degree at the time. And I remember uh, taking five minutes to step out of the class just to make sure my sons were in the house safe. Um, I have brothers, you know, um, and, and right now I work at BCC and I see so many young men and I just, I want to, you know, I just want to make sure like they understand the importance of them getting their education and, and, and voting and all of those things because, um, I don't know. I just feel like I've seen so much death here in the Bronx, and not just by the hands of the police, um, by the people in the community killing each other, which kind of made me sad, and it makes me feel like I need to leave my community, or how could I help my community? So Black Lives Matter um, really means me the preservation of life, right? Um, we, we need to preserve our lives. Um, we have other people killing us off. We don't need to be killing each other off. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shamika, for sharing with us. Uh, I want to now bring in uh, Clifford L. Marshall, who's the director of the Bail Empowerment Network. And when we talk about black men uh, and we talk about Black Lives Matter, uh, we know that it's the death of George Floyd that really sparked another set of outrage on behalf. And I can identify what Shamika said. My son was with me. Uh, he was living in Florida at the time. Uh, and I remember watching the verdict come back uh, from Trayvon Martin. And he was there and I had tears in my eyes and I said, you just don't understand yet, you know? And unfortunately for us as black men, we have to have a talk with our sons uh, in the way that others don't have to have talks. Um, that's called privilege. But we're not always, we're, we don't have that luxury of not being able to have those talks or we don't have the luxury of not being able to have those talks. And so I wanna bring Clifford in and I want him to have an opportunity to share uh, a little bit as uh, he's also director of the Male Empowerment Network. Uh, talk to us from a black male perspective, uh, what should people know about Black Lives Matter uh, and why it's important to you? Uh, well, thank you, Jamie, for that for that question. And I just wanna thank, um, I just wanna thank, you know, President of the SGA, uh, Priscilla, and uh, the legal legislator, Gabriel, for inviting me on this talk here. And I wanna thank my colleagues for being here. Um, you know, as a black man growing up in New York City, I, I'm, I'm a product of Harlem, and um, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had had, had confrontations, uh, you know, you know, with the police, and and I was a guy who I did everything correctly. They told me, you know, you know go to school, get an education, you graduate, you go to college, and so for me to have confrontations or to me to be caught up in any type of police action, the police pulling me over was was very devastating to me. And I grew up in a household where my dad wasn't around as much. And uh, he died you know, pretty young in my life. He died uh, when I was only 20 years of age. I was, in, I was at college at the time when he passed away. So we didn't have a lot of interaction. But um, I can truly say that my mother and my father always instilled in me to be a role model. And it's strange, but ever since I was a young person, my mother told me that you know, there are younger people watching you. So one of the things I've always tried to aspire to is to be a role model. And you know, when I when I graduated from college, I didn't think that I would be in the in the mentoring you know business. Uh, I didn't think I would even be in the educational business. But um, you know, the uh, you know the universe had other plans for me, and they put me at at a college at Bronx Community College, where I've been around for 20 years. And uh, and, and some of my partners are on this call here, um, you know, Mr. Eugene Adams and, and Dr. Bernard Gant. Uh, so with us three. Back in 2005, we, we started a male mentoring program, and it all be, it all came you know through the vision of, of Bernard Gant, and uh, Bernard Gant and myself. We both grew up in Harlem, and we both have seen some things, and we knew that it was important for us to mentor our young men. And the reason why it was important for us to mentor our young men is because you know these instances that we're seeing now, you know, visually has been going on for years. Um, it's always been there, as Shamika said, Anthony Baez, I remember the Anthony Baez case. Uh, Eugene Adams has been working with Mrs. Amadou Diaz, I mean, 
This is Diallo, Amadou Diallo's mother for years. Uh, and he has brought her into the BCC family where we're setting up something now to, 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 to do something to help you know, our young students understand that, uh, that we're going to be there to you know, help them out. Um, and you know, right now, what we're seeing because of social media and because of, uh, because of the, the regular media, we're seeing how strong our women are. I mean, I'm so proud to hear uh, Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson and what she had to say. I'm proud of, 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 yeah. of, Tiffany, of, of Tiffany Dubon, who helped you know, put this together. I'm proud of Shamika Pierce, who, you know, who helped put this together, and she's doing some great things. I'm just proud of the women that are stepping up. So our job in the Male Empowerment Network is to let our men know our women need us to be there for them side by side. Our young men need to understand that we, you know, in the history of African Americans, Latino Americans, uh, the women have always been there to protect us. And we can still see them out there fighting, fighting, fighting for us, but we need to instill in our young men that they need to step up as leaders. They need to you know, take the reins and be out there fighting just as hard as these women are. So, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gant helped start this program because he had two sons at BCC. And he said, listen, man, I, I want my boys to understand what it means to be responsible young men. And he started this program. He brought me in. He brought in Eugene Adams. And for 20 years, all three of us have been together. And since 2004, we've been running the Male Empowerment Network. And, uh, and there's some people on this call who, who we've watched grow. Um, our dean, Manny Lopez, we watched him when he was a young man who came into the school. And we watched him as he grew. And now he's a dean. And uh, we're really proud of him. And I've had students come up to me and who have graduated and they will bring their kids back to me. Shamika's son, she brought her son you know, to me. So that just helps me to know that we're doing something correct. And our program have had, we've had a talk where we brought the police in to talk to our kids about what we should be talking, you know, how they should be speaking when the police confront them. We've had talks on the N-word, you know, back in the day, the N-word was a big thing. Uh, so we've had workshops and conferences, uh, and uh, I'm just hoping that when I leave BCC, that you know that my legacy would be that Mr. Marshall helped that many young men understand that the importance of leadership, the importance of taking responsibility, and the importance of supporting our women as we go through this fight. Yeah, thank you very much, Clifford, for uh, sharing with us, and we'll be back to you. Uh, with a couple of other questions uh, as we continue. Uh, I want to do this, go back to our panelists again and have an opportunity to talk. Uh, somebody has to tell me if the council, is Councilwoman Gibson still on? She actually she? said she'll try to jump back on later, uh, okay. later in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So what I'll do is I'll go uh, to our panelists and I'll ask this question. Um, I feel kind of like dated myself a little older because when you talk about Anthony Baez um, and the Francis Lavodi case, when I first came to BronxNet uh, as a journalist, I used to anchor the news five nights a week and we covered that case. Uh, and I spent time uh, with the Baez family, also interviewed the officer Francis Lavodi. I remember when the verdict came down because it came down late on a Friday, uh, Friday afternoon, it was 6 p.m. Uh, I'll never forget, it was 6 p.m. on a Friday uh, and the verdict came down. It was Judge Shinelin who made the verdict and said, listen, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that he told the truth about everything, but we still found him not guilty. Uh, and it set off a firestorm uh, in the Bronx. And so those activists taking to the streets and people protesting. And so we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, we can see from Black Lives, Brown Lives, uh, all communities of color have been feeling this pain for a long, long time. But for those of us who know about Black Lives Matter, um, it's not just about criminal justice, right? It's not just about police, but there's other issues that are tied to Black Lives Matter. There's education that's tied to Black Lives Matter and the injustice in the educational system. There's employment that you have to talk about. Um, there's also housing. Uh, there's also environmental injustice. Uh, there's a whole variety of platforms that actually are connected to what we now know 
is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but I want to go to each of the panelists and I'll start again. I'll come back with, I'll start with Shamika first and then after Shamika, um, then I'll come back to Senator Flowers and get your thoughts. Out of all of these different movements, is there one that you're particularly passionate about? Um, some could say maybe it's criminal justice. Some could say it's education. But let us know what movement are you particularly passionate about um, and why? And so uh, Shamika, I'll start with you. I think really um, it's the, the the Black Lives Matter movement, um, just because I, I just remember waking up the, um, after hearing it or seeing what happened to George Floyd and just feeling frustrated. Then the riots that happened right outside my window, the, the looting that happened right outside my window, I think those recent events just kind of really made me frustrated. Um, the, you know, I didn't really know how to get involved, you know, except for just encouraging the students that I see on a daily basis. Um, and, and making sure they understand how important it is for them to finish their education and being a role model to those students. But when I hear um, looting and, and rioting happening right outside of my bedroom window where I'm frightened and I'm making sure that my children are still in the house and they're not out in the streets on Fordham Road or the Grand Concourse. I think that really set something off. I, I woke up the next day um, feeling helpless. Um, and that's why I reached out to some of my colleagues and said, we, we need to do something about it. And we started this, um, this group where we meet every other week, it's called the Social Justice Network. Because like, if I was feeling that way, then the students that go to the school where I serve and that live in the same community that I live in, they have to be feeling the same way. And every day I sit in my window, this window, um, and I look outside, which is facing the Grand Concourse. And I remember when the pandemic first hit, the liquor store was open. Um, and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, highlighting the liquor store itself. I'm highlighting the fact that this is a store that's been in my community for years and served the people in my community through the years. And I, um, I know that they had a lot of business during the pandemic, but when you, when you see the people that you serve in your community go and loot this store. And I look out the window and I'm like, wow, all of the other stores, the hair care, um, the beauty salons, the, the, the 99 cent stores, the chat cash in place, the pharmacies, all of these stores have reopened after the rioting. And I look and I see the liquor store has not opened. And I'm just thinking if I was this store owner and I looked on my cameras and I seen the people in my community looting my store. These are people that hang out in my store every day, looting my store. And, and not once, but three times that night, the police chased them away. Um, I don't know if I would want to reopen. And this store haven't reopened. And just so many businesses I see, and, and they were on the news. They felt the same way. Like, these are the people I've been serving in this community for years. And these are the people who's destroying their own community. So these recent events are, are, I think I'm the most passionate about these recent events. What happened to George Floyd? What happened to George Floyd? And what happened as a result of what happened to George Floyd right here in my own neighborhood? So I think that's why I'm the most passionate about this movement. Right. Senator Flowers, for you, talk to us about what you're passionate about within this whole social justice movement that the Black Lives Matter carries out because they do a lot of advocacy in a lot of different areas. But for you, what are you most passionate about and what have you been advocating for? What I've been advocating for, uh, uh, again, I'm still with the youth. I'm more passionate about trying to find a way to reach these youth, you know, um, since the riot has begun, you know, it doesn't change nothing from uh, what has been happening to Black lives, the American black man, because even since the 90s, you know, there's only three places that we were going then, jail, a mental hospital, or death. And it's still similar to the taxes, death, and uh, trouble. Where you know, we got to find a way to, uh, I'm passionate about trying to get these kids off the, off the corner. 
I'm passionate about trying to, in my own neighborhood, when I look around, there's no youth center, there's nothing there. And this is one step for me that I've been working on in my heart, trying to find a way to reach out to these young kids. And um, now that um, I am doing an internship at a community center, there's so much that I couldn't really put my finger on because I have been in the street, I've been a product of the street, and I'm from the street. But now to attend college at my age right now, I see there's so much that I've wasted my time on that I would like to help someone else uh, better their lives. And um, my passion is to just reach out to people and try to help them as much as I can in the communities, uh, institutions, whatever. You know, I go to AA meetings. I've um, uh, been clean now for over 30 something years. So my my experience of trying to deal with this Black Lives Matter is totally different from you, you all the panelists here and all the people here on this uh, screen right here. Um, which I'm saying the mind is no better, but I can find no better word than to say I am willing to work with all people so that we can better this country. I don't have a particular, everything is a passion to me. I've seen death, I've seen everything. And uh, to wake up every morning, I'm blessed, but uh, somebody didn't wake up this morning. And that's the thing that troubles me, that uh, a person died necklace, you know, not needlessly. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Shamika, she's talking about all the looting and all that. Yeah, I remember that when I was eight years old. You know, and it's still going on today. So, you know, some people we are going to reach and some people we are not going to reach. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to hurt the heart. And my passion is to try to create something, like get something going for everyone to feel yeah. safe about their lives. That's it. Thank you. I'm going to tap into Clifford again uh, when we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, because what, what we understand about Black Lives Matter is this is that there's a rising up to say that the black life matters. And it matters because America has devalued the life of the black man, the black woman, communities of color, the devaluing. And when we saw the death of George Floyd, and I think that what really got us all was, it wasn't just George Floyd, we watched Ahmaud Arbery and we watched his life snuffed out on television, and we were all home to watch that. We saw the same thing happen with George Floyd, home to watch that. Breonna Taylor, now that we see the video about that. There seems to be this constant devaluing of the black life that Black Lives Matter raises its voice to try to bring. So talk to us about, uh, in your work, because you've been working with male empowerment, how you see that men, are not really valued, and what the message is that you try to bring to men as we go out into this world and have to deal with being, quote unquote, having a target on our backs. Let's just keep it 100. Yeah, no, you you know, you're absolutely right. You I should be nice about it, but there it is. No, Darren, you, you know, you're right. We gotta go probably go have a drink one day and find this in the bar one day. But, um, yeah, you know, that's one of my favorite words, Darren. One of my favorite words is value. One of the things we do at, you know, when I if you talk to any of my any of my students, uh, you know, they'll tell you, Mr. Marshall's always talking about value, you know, bringing value. And um, for, you know, for our lives to be devalued just because of the color of our skin, you know, really puts a burden on you because no matter what you bring to the table, if they see the color of your skin first, you know, they, they, they may turn, they may tune you out. And um, so, but what I, what I try to instill in, 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 in my students is that, you, you know, listen, you got to bring value. And one of the ways to bring value, of course, is through education. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the education game over 20 years now, and I realized the importance of education. And I don't care what occupation that you want to do, you got to be educated about it. And you know, when you ask that question about, you know, what movement are you interested in with the other two, other two panelists, the big movement that I'm interested in, of course, is economic power. Um, there is no doubt in, in our minds, we see the numbers, uh, the, uh, the value of a black family's economics is half of that of the of, of, of Caucasians. So we have to figure a way to change this economic, um, this economic difference. And because America has built its e economic power on the backs of black people, we need to find a way to get 
a piece of this. And right now, you see, we see across the country that the, the marijuana game is, 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 is being eliminated, where a lot of our people were incarcerated for smoking marijuana or selling small bits of marijuana. Now they're, they're legalizing it and, and they're trying to lock us out that game. So, you know, we can look at everything in America. We can look at music, we can look at sports, you know, uh, we can look at the number game. I mean, before Lotto, the, you know, one of the main ways of earning money was the number man. The number man looked just like me and you, Darren. And now all of a sudden they legalized Lotto and we are, we are cut out. So we have to find a way to, 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 to educate our, our young people on economics. And, you know, there's a great book out there by, by Dr. Claude Anderson. I'm, I'm quite sure you know who that is. And uh, it's called Powernomics. I would advise anybody to go out there and just get that book, Powernomics. He talks about that. But in this lifetime, it's, it's about the economic game. And uh, at the Mail Empowerment Network, we constantly, you know, constantly trying to find ways to empower our students by making sure that they don't have these money issues. So the program gets money and we try to give it to the students, um, you know, the best way that we can, because I believe that is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's real, it's real important. You talk about the economic game and you talk about the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of disparity that goes on. And when you talk about Black Lives Matter, that's exactly what Black Lives Matter is about. It's really about dealing with a lot of the disparities that we face and we face, you know, in education. And I think BCC is a great example of dealing with some of the disparities that we have within our community, because uh, there are a lot of people who are in our community right now and they don't have Wi-Fi don't have laptops, don't have access to resources, but I know that, you know, through gifts to the council and uh, the work of Dr. Siganegbi and others to make sure that no student is left behind educationally um, to deal with some of the disparities that we face that sometimes other communities don't recognize. And so uh, to put value and to add value to people's lives, uh, something as simple as Wi-Fi and a laptop and a computer, you'd be surprised at how much dignity that actually gives to put people at just the same platform as other people uh, continue to have, which kind of like segues me into the next question um, that I want to bring to our panelists, because, you know, we do want our students to be safe. We do want people of color to feel safe in this country, right? And we don't just want people of color to feel safe in this country. We want them to feel safe, you know, in our communities, uh, in the borough of the Bronx, and then also in our CUNY schools. But more particularly, let's just bring it closer to home and talk about BCC. Um, and so, Shamika, help us with what can we actually do? I mean, as far as helping and making the institution better so that Black Lives Matter and that students can feel safe in this environment, what can we do uh, as both students and institution to make uh, BCC better in the area of Black Lives Matter? Well, at BCC, I think we've already started the work. I think the first thing we needed to do was start having conversations, right? Um, providing safe spaces for our students to feel comfortable to have these conversations about what's going on in this in their communities and across the country. Um, uh, my colleagues and I have been working on programming um, to give our students tools um, how they can get involved and, and have a, a positive effect on change. Um, one of the things that we pushed all year long, which I am very, very proud to say, is the importance of the vote. I've talked to students over the years. I've talked to people in my community who felt like their vote didn't matter, right? Um, but we pushed it. We pushed it. I pushed it in on the campus and events. I pushed it outside of um, campus in my community. And um, you can see the result of that. People got up and went out and vote. And this year I seen, I've seen so many young people come out to vote. And, and now you can see the result of your voice exercising your right to um, have your voice be heard. So I think we've started doing the work at um, BCC already. I think having these conversations, um, bringing in people like you guys to talk to our students and let them know if you want to um, have a positive effect on change, this is what you need to do. And just making sure that they have those tools. I think um, staff, faculty, administration, the support we 
share with each other um supporting each other and just making sure we have the tools so that we can be mentally okay emotionally okay to help our students senator flowers i'll pose the same question to you what can we be doing to uh you know help here on the campus of bcc i agree with uh shamika we uh i don't know too much what's going on on the campus right now because it's a virtual thing but i believe that we should have more uh, places available to where they, uh, we can meet and have these discussions and, uh, the you know, let them know that your vote counted. Yeah, it did count. We got a new president. And there's a lot of things that we still need to work on as a group. We need to have uh, places that we can meet and discuss these problems. Me, myself, I, I'm a member of Mount Gilead Baptist Church. So I was meeting with those young people in there and encouraging them. There, a lot of them was about to graduate, so you know they asking for places where they can go to feel safe within the city itself. What school can I go to? A lot of them, I told them BCC because I go there, and you know, that's where all we get. We got to come together as a group, and like I said, at the BCC campus, yes, we need to have more space out there so that we can uh, have people come together and they can feel safe that they can voice their opinion, voice their thoughts. And um, yeah. that's about it. Yeah. yeah. Cliff, Clifford. Yeah. Yeah. So, Same question, uh, bro. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a veteran, of, I'm a veteran of BCC, you know, colleague. I've been there 20 years. And let me, let me just say this to everyone out there. Um, I've been to, I've been to different campuses. I've been to different places, but BCC is one of the, the, the most inclusive places when it comes to our students. Um, we, we, we do provide safe spaces for them. I mean, my program in, in itself, we probably have the best space on campus. Um, you know, we have a, we have a lounge area, uh, we have a computer lab connected to it. And then they have my office. Uh, we're right there in the student center. As soon as you come down in the student center, you go down the hallway, you'll see us there. Um, we have a very, very nice safe space. Um, but I think throughout my my career at BCC, I can truly say that the BCC, once you come off of University of Avenue to come on the campus, uh, you do feel a sense of, of camaraderie and a sense of safety -ness. Uh, I know I'm constantly in contact with public safety and asking them all the time. I see them, hey, how's everything going? And they're like, hey, everything's under control. They say everything's under control. So I feel like our campus has done a great job when it, when it comes to making students feel safe making my colleagues and myself feel safe. I've never had any issues at, at BCC when it comes down to feeling safe. So that's just the beginning. And then I think with myself and my colleagues, we, as Shamika said, we have started to put the programs together. I mean, even right now, I have a Zoom call every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for hours so students can just log in and they can, and they can just talk to me or all of my colleagues about you know, what's going on. We've had some deep discussions. I know uh, Dean Lopez is now doing the same thing where you can speak to the Dean and just talk to him every Friday. So these are the things that we're creating at BCC. And um, we've had a lot of events just like this one that, that Tiffany and Shamika and, and Dr. Razo have, have put together. And we've had some great turnouts. Uh, you know, Tiffany DeBarn put together the Social uh, Justice Network where they're putting together a lot of programming. So right now, Devin, I think for anyone out there, uh, if you're a BCC, you're a BCC person and you got friends and family, you know, just like the senator said, I would definitely recommend them to come to Bronx Community College because right now you will feel included, you'll feel safe and you have, and we have opened it up where you can speak about anything you want to. Because I believe tomorrow we're having the town hall. I think it's tomorrow or the other day, right, Tiffany? It's just tomorrow. On, yeah, tomorrow's Wednesday. I was going to say on Wednesday, but yes, tomorrow. Yeah, so we're having a town hall meeting. And at that town hall, students, staff, faculty members can just speak their minds and, and talk about how they feel about the, uh, about the past election and, and what's going on. So um, I definitely feel good. Um, I, I, I encourage everybody out there, you know, you want to learn more about, about my program, um, you can definitely you know, just contact us, the Mail Empowerment Network, and we'd be looking to help anybody out there. I mean, Senator Flowers, I think I've met you, and you may have come to my office before, but if you haven't, you know, you just need to get involved with us because we want to do more for, for young people. You're definitely the place to be. Thank you. I accept you all. Thank you. 
And uh, also, you know, any of you can jump in right now because we want to talk because somebody might be watching right now saying, listen, you know, I want to be a part of some of these organizations and I don't know what's out there at BCC to be connected to. I think Clifford uh, started about, you know, with the work that he's doing with Black Male Empowerment as well. I'll come back to Shamika and ask her the question about things that people can be involved in. If there's students out there or their parents that are connected or anybody that's out here watching right now, um, what can somebody do to be a part of some of these organizations Tell us about. Well, first and foremost, I am the inter-organizational council um, manager, which is all of the clubs and organizations that students participate in at Ross Community College, except for the SGA and the Mel Empowerment Network. Um, I work very closely with Yvonne Arazo, Dr. Yvonne Arazo, who's the faculty advisor. So students can definitely join a, a club or a student organization. Um, and to get information about that, they can either go onto the Bronx Community College website under the Student Life page, and there's a list of different clubs and organizations with their contact information and um, where and what modality they're using to meet on. Um, they also can reach out directly to myself or Dr. Irazo, and I'll put that, um, I'll put my contact information in the chat. So if there's students there that's interested, they definitely can reach, send, send me an email or send Dr. Irazo an email. Um, the other ways, like um, Mr. Marshall said, they can join the Mel Empowerment Network. We have um, a woman up, uh, a woman up group, if I'm correct, I think that's the name of it, for women to um, encourage and support women on campus. We have so, so many different support services. Students just need to know that we have it and reach out. There's, um, I think they may have changed their name to arc but there's a program if students are having trouble with um rent if students are having trouble with child care if students are having trouble with um being homeless or they need to look for a job there's programs on campus we have a personal counseling office if students feel like they need mental health um help we have these programs on campus and if you don't know exactly to who to reach out to you can reach out to the office of student life student life is your connection to all of the support services on campus if you reach out to myself tiffany Zabon, mary Velez, who i believe is on this call um dr yvonne arazo i'm not sure if she's on this call um, Dean Manny Lopez, we can more than likely direct you to any one of these programs on campus. Students just need to know that they, we have them. We don't know how to help you if you don't tell us, but if you come to us, we are more than glad to direct you to any program that you're interested in. And if there is a club on the website, if there's an interest that you have and you don't see it on the website or you don't see it on our list of clubs of organizations, let us know and we'll figure out how we can start a club or an organization that you're interested in. All righty also have the LGBTQI plus resource room. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. But yes, we have all kinds of resources on campus for students. Okay. And um, Senator Flowers, I know that you've been involved as, uh, as you said, you're highly involved in government uh, on campus. Talk to us about the work that you do, how people can be connected. Well, I'm also uh, on the Committee of Academic STEMI and also the Committee of Academic Freedom. And be advised, I'm, I'm um, this is my first year being a senator at BCC, so I'm still a, um, exploring and finding out a lot of things in which ways that I can help students in the future and uh, right now. And um, my uh, the one thing I said uh, when I told the senators, other senators, why I joined the BCC senator program is because I felt lonely, and it, it's a place to be if you join one of these clubs. You you know, you won't be quite alone. This can be scary to be out here in this world, especially if they're just coming out of school. And that's oh, that kind of reminds me of uh, someone out in the street when they walk up to you and ask you for direct directions. So, you know, I've always been kind-hearted. I'm a veteran of the United States Army, and it was always my thing to help someone. But my motto is to always uh, each one teach one. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of the... SGA and I advise everyone in the Bronx Community School, all students, to try to get into a uh, 
club or something. It can make your life a whole lot better. Yeah. And I want people to utilize the chat bar if you do. Um, I, as we're talking about resources and things, uh, if you throw that in the chat bar right now, I think some of us who are participating have an opportunity to see exactly and can be connected. I thought I see Clifford threw something in there uh, as well. Uh, I know that the LGBTQ resource group uh, is listed in there as well. Um, so please continue to utilize the chat bar so that way more and more of us can get the information um to how you can actually be involved active in the process um so that way you can find out um more uh as we talk about black lives matter and how you can be connected to um a movement and so when we think about communities of color and how black lives matter um just think right now that if it wasn't for um black lives that really made the difference in a lot of this presidential election. When you think about what happened in Georgia, what happened was basically black lives came out. You talk about Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, a lot of black lives came out. When you talk about what happened in Michigan, uh, Detroit, a lot of those black lives and those black community uh, came out. In Wisconsin, it was also in uh, Milwaukee in that area. And it turned an election. And so a lot of people uh, who, always want to ask the question, do Black Lives Matter? Black Lives extremely matter because when you look at what's happened in this presidential election, much of it can be attributed to um, Black Lives helping the new president-elect be able to turn uh, and become the president-elect uh, today. So we want to make sure that you do that. So um, listen, uh, I hear people saying, listen, they want to be more involved in their community and make a positive impact. So yeah, find out about what clubs you can be a part of what organizations that you can be connected to and there you could actually um, make a difference and you'd be surprised uh, what one voice can do uh, you can be that next voice that could possibly turn something around um tiffany how am i doing with time if i can i can ask another question i know you got question answers you let me know what you want me to do go ahead you I can ask another question and then we're after that we'll jump into the q a okay Okay, so I'll, I'll do this then. Before uh, we leave, I'm gonna start off. We'll go ladies first, Shamika. Uh, give us um, your final thoughts as to what you want people to know with regards to Black Lives Matter. I will do it briefly. I think the most important thing is to understand like we're not saying our lives should be the only lives that matter. We just want to be treated fairly. We want to be able to go to the um, educational institution of our choice. We want um, good health care. We want to be able to apply for a job and not have to worry about the color of our skin. We want our children to grow up in, um, in safe communities. We want good police in, in our communities. So I think for me, that kind of sums it up. I want my sons to be able to raise their children in a fair world. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to Senator Flowers and I'm gonna see if I can get on this. Go ahead, Senator Flowers. Yes, I think that uh, what I want everyone, that we shouldn't be uh, racial profiled. Uh, we shouldn't be, you know, always have a stigma attached to us. We are, we are people just like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? We Unfortunately, everybody makes mistakes, and uh, but that doesn't have to linger with the black black lives. You know, we make mistakes. That's it. So eliminate all this racial profiling and uh, the stigmas, and let these kids live their lives because uh, somebody's got to lead the way. That's all I okay, Clifford. Yes, and uh, I guess what I want everyone to get out of Black Lives Matter is that one, um, you have a right to protest and you have a right to let your voice be heard. And this is what um, has occurred through the Black Lives Matter. And then another thing is that I just want our students and our people out there to know that it's important that you go out there and you get the best education that you can get so that you can become economically free to do the things that you want to do in life. Uh, I see some people in the chat say they want to get more involved. Well, you know what? One of the ways you can get involved is to go out there and definitely get your education. And through education, you will meet people and you'll find out what the needs and wants are out there in the world. And you can just, you know, you can dedicate your life to that. And um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to, you know, to touching base with all of you out there who may want to learn more about what you can do at DCC and more about the Mail Empowerment Network. Okay. 
I saw a comment. I think it came from, I can't, if I pronounce your name wrong, please forgive me. It's his scene. And he says, could you please discuss the process, the political right hijack, the defund the police demand movement and what we can do to frame and control the political discourse around this demand. So I think I can handle that for you. Um, when we talk about um, defund the police, um, from what I understand and from what it is, many people have taken the approach that when we talk about defunding the police, that the community, particularly Black Lives Matter and other movements, are anti-police. And that's simply not true. It's not being about anti-police, but it's really about being pro-community. And so when we talk about the discussion that's being had about defunding the police, maybe defund is a strong word. And maybe people feel like that's too strong a word. But what it's talking about is not getting rid of all the money for the police department, but reallocating that budget. Because there's so much money that's given to police in our city and it deals with the area of, you know, uh, the militarization of police, over policing and things of that neighborhood. If you could take some of that money, because the New York City Police Department budget is huge, and taking some of that money out of that budget and putting it towards community and putting it towards resources, that's exactly what Black Lives Matter is representing and other organizations. It's not talking about taking all the money away from police and being anti-police. It's really about being pro-community, but we have to have intelligent conversation and we have to know exactly what's being said and what's being put on the table so that way people can understand exactly what this is about. There's a huge budget. And when we talk about the NYPD budget, it's one of the largest line items in our city's budget. And if you could just get a few of those dollars and put it towards community, put it towards youth empowerment, I'm sure Clifford would take the money and take it with male empowerment anytime. I think Dr. Second Enemy would love to see more money come to schools and organizations and things like that. So that's what it's talking about when we talk about the discourse that's actually being, you know, that's being given. So, you know, the truth is, you're right. And I see who is it? Uh, Jagita, I think it is, talking about, you know, we're in a pandemic and a whole lot of people are dealing with food, you know, insecurity on campus. And so uh, having a way of being able to tackle that, reallocating resources to be able to deal with that. These are some of the things that Black Lives Matter is really trying to is trying to do. And so uh, I think there's some answers going on in, oh, in, in the chat. Yeah, I'm I, um, sorry to interrupt, but we do have Gabriel and Priscilla who have been collecting all of the questions in order in the chat from the beginning of the panel discussion. Right. So, um, and, and you know, at this point, um, Darren, thank you so much. We would actually like for you to jump on in, right, with the panel um, if, there, if you have any thoughts with any of these questions that will be um, coming up. So uh, at this point in time, Gabriel and, and Priscilla, go, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Um, I want to uh, I want to I want to say uh, thank you so much, Mr. Jamie, for moderating this important discussion. You performed a super job, and it really comes from my from the bottom of my heart. Uh, now, Madam President Tokor, like you know, Tiffany has said, and I will read questions we received from the chat. So the first one is from Luis Alvarez. Uh, he asked um, to the panel. The funding the police has a stigma attached to it due to the misinformation about the movement. Uh, to me, it means allocating the funds from the police departments to services that benefit the communities. What does defunding the police mean to you? And please be sincere. Please be sincere. Well, can I start? Of course. Yeah. So I just want to, I just, I, I just, everything that Jamie said was absolutely positively spot on. And um, I'm not going to say any. I'm not going to add any more to what Darren said because he said it greatly. But what I just want to say is that, um, you know, I have family members who are police officers, and police officers are not rich, but that budget is rich. Mm -hmm. So where is the money going, right? So that's the whole thing. It's not like that money is going to the police officers who are patrolling our neighborhoods, right? And and that's the main thing. It's like, okay, we want you guys to be accountable. You know, show us where the money is going. And it's like, if anybody's out there into sports, it's like the NCAA, where you have NC, you have schools out there making all this money, and the students are starving who played on the teams. Where is the money going? So, just want to use that analogy. 
Um, anyone else want to answer that question? I can't uh, see anyone, so please, I can't really see anyone at, at the same time. So please, if you want to answer the question, uh, feel free to uh, to jump on. Well, I'll just jump in real quick. Um, when when I first heard about defunding the police, I thought the same thing, right? I felt like if you defund the police, if you defund the police, who's gonna protect our communities? Until I asked questions and I did some research and I learned about exactly what Mr. Marshall and Darren was saying. So yes, I do agree that um, it might be a good idea to. Um, allocate those for, um, for funds to um, community services, um, you know, maybe creating something like uh, another boys and girls center in the community. So students will, I mean, so the, the, the youth in the community will have somewhere to go instead of being on a street corner or, or get into, in, getting into some form of, of trouble or maybe investing in um, some some subsidiary educational programming, you know? Um, I would like to see something like that happen. Yeah, I feel the same way too, that I can remember a time when uh, they used to have a cop on every corner. We don't see that much. They don't do that kind of patrolling anymore, but yeah, we should allocate this, uh, these funds to, uh, within the different communities to help these youth from, stop them from standing on the corner. And also, you know, to try to, uh, build more uh, community centers, help the communities out, invest, in, you know, allocate this money to communities so that they can do something with it. Through the police, uh, they have a uh, boys and girls club, but, you know, in certain neighborhoods, they don't. So that's what they need to do, uh, spread the money out. You know, that's what I think. You know, what's so interesting is that, and I, and I, and I hear this constantly about, um, constantly about standing on the corner. So, you know, I, like I said, I grew up in Harlem, and remember, when you live in an urban, an urban community, um, unlike living in the suburbs where you would leave, you know, you have backyards and you can go into you your backyard or you have front yard, you can hang out in your front yard and, and, and no one paid attention to it. In the urban community, your stoop is your front yard. Okay. Your, you know, so the corner is, when they say the corner, I was one of those guys who used to hang out in front of my building we had fun, you know, back in the days, they used to have what they call PAL play streets. I don't know if some of y'all remember those, where they used to block off the street, no cars would come through, and we used to play in the play street. That was our park and our, you know, where we hung out. A lot of good people just hung out in front of the building. We talked, hip hop was just coming out. We did our thing out there. So um, I don't think it's so much with getting people off the corner as it is, as it's so much to make things productive. As long as you can make things productive, uh, if you could, if you can find a way to incorporate programs within the community and make it productive, then I think that we, uh, you know, we, we could do a, some great things. And I think what Jamie was saying is that, hey, let's kind of take a little bit of that money and let's put it into the community, whether it's in the street that have a bunch of tenements. I grew up in a tenement and we had the play street, or it's a project uh, built in New York City housing where you have a whole bunch of people and, you know, where are the kids going to go? Kids have to go somewhere. They have to be a part of something. Okay, so we have this next question from Donovan Griffin. How do you respond to black police officers who contribute to police brutality? I'd like to start. Um, so in, in that situation, I don't see, I don't see black, I don't see white. I see this is the police, right? And I remember in my way early in my twenties, um, I've seen something really bad happen to my brother as a result of a black police officer. He actually wound up going to jail for it. Um, so at that time, I didn't see that, you know, this was a black man or I just saw this is the police. And I know I grew up learning about this, 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 um, this blue code or the, the the blue code that the police officers stand behind. So yeah, I, I I don't see a difference between a black officer or a white officer committing a crime against um um someone in a a, a, a neighborhood a community where a lot of 
people are poor or just facing disparity, right? I don't see the difference. I just see that this is a problem for the police and the police needs, like someone mentioned in the ch chat, there needs to be restructuring. There needs to be maybe some training. Something has to happen where it's not just white police that we're targeting, it's the police department. And that's just my take. My intake on that is it's almost the same, but being a, a victim of, or, or let's just say I was arrested, most of the time that when I, when I was arrested, I was arrested by a black cop. So I didn't see no uh, difference in that anyway. You know, I figured he was doing his job. It's the way that uh, some black police officers go about their job that I think this young person is talking about. Because uh, you remember now, uh, you know, you can come with the word dirty cops and all that, but I still think there's always a quota that motivates these cops to do, you know, to make arrests. Because some of these things you can walk away from, like we spoke earlier today that now they're trying to legalize marijuana. A lot of that, uh, these kids uh, went in jails and we talked about the Rockefeller law. Uh, a lot of black cops were undercover cops then. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they couldn't get the, you know, they couldn't get the bad guys, the, uh, well, we talk about dirty cops. They couldn't get the money, so they would arrest a guy just to get information. So, okay. you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a taut up and down thing. It's a toss and turn. But uh, as far as I look at long as the cop is doing his job, then uh, I don't put a color to it. But I still stand that there's a blue wall and there's a blue mm -hmm. coat that these all of them get into sooner or later. Mm -hmm. You just had the... Uh, TV show um, about uh, the guy that just died, the actor that just died, of how they all came together. Bosnis, uh, what's his name? And uh, yeah, closing all the bridges. Remember that movie? It's, it's true. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very true. Oh, There's yeah. a wall there that they all come together. It's, uh, it's, it's just depend on what kind of crime it is at that time. But, you know, they are good cops and they are bad cops. And that's how they play the role when you go to jail. There's a good one, there's a bad one. So they all wear the color blue. Um, thank you all for answering that question. Now from Brian Reynoso. Considering that the Bronx is home to many di diverse groups, mostly black and brown lives, how would you say we have been able to contribute to becoming the backbone of making the movement as widespread as it is in this country? I'll, I'll say, I'll just jump in real quick and say this, that, you know, when we talk about New York City, um, and I did this from a journalistic perspective too, right? Um, I want us to understand that if we look at this past election, there's 62 counties in New York State. The Bronx is, you know, we hear about the Bronx being number 62 in the area of health, right? Um, it's important to know that even though the state went blue, the truth of the matter is that, uh, 47 out of the 62 counties in New York state voted for Donald Trump, 47 of them, 47 of the 62 counties in New York state actually voted for Donald Trump. You know what the difference was between all of them, the people in the five boroughs, <laughs> New York city, it was New York city that put the, put the blue into uh, New York becoming a, a democratic state. What I'm trying to say is this, is that it's people like ourselves, you, I, um, in that urban demographic that actually help the president elect to become elected. And so right here, exercising our voice, being active, doing what we do, will be the, it was the difference maker. And so let's not think that our work does not count. Let's not think that our voice doesn't matter. Let's not think that black lives don't matter. And, and this movement that we just saw right here in New York City of a, a great wave of people actually helped to stem the tide for New York State. So when we think about what happens and our voice doesn't count and things don't matter, no, it actually does matter. And so when you organize a get out to vote rally right here in, in the city and in the school, that makes a difference. And those voices and those and those votes count. And so in the grander scheme of things, you know, sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit, but just know that what we're doing here with boots on the ground is really making a difference. And it also made a difference in what we just saw a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add to that, you know, you know, you know, Jamie is definitely right. I know my partner who's on this call, Eugene Adams, used to always say, the further north you go, the further south you go. 
right? <laughs> <laughs> you leave these five boroughs and you will find red, you will find people of, of, of the Republican Party right outside of New York, the five boroughs of New York City. So um, yeah, he's absolutely right. We definitely make a difference and we are strong. Yes, the Ku Klux Klan started upstate in the Binghamton area. Like, let's not forget. <laughs> and you went to Binghamton. <laughs> I think a lot of the issues also affect us here in this city. I think, you know, with COVID, you know, look, we, we were the epicenter of COVID. Um, jobs, education, uh, um the marches, the every we were a target when it came to um, those 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 marches that happened months ago. We we were in the news. The, the president talked about how disappointed he was in in New York City, right where he comes from. So I think a, a, the important thing to keep in mind is that a lot of those issues, a lot of those things that Biden talked about in his campaign, those are the things that we're looking for. Those are those are the issues that affect us. So, you know, it, it, and making sure that we got out to vote, that was important. It also was monumental. And what I say to that is keep the momentum. Don't just stop here. We got to keep the momentum. We don't know if... Um, Number 45 is going to run again in uh, in four years. He's been talking about it, but we don't know. So we can't we can't get um we can't we can't just relax now because we did it. We have to keep the momentum. So if, if I leave you with anything, it's that. Thank you all. So the next question will be from Sarah Otis. How can we hold our elected officials accountable to address racism in the school to prison pipeline? Can you repeat the question? How can we hold our elected officials accountable to address racism in school to prison pipeline? First of all, I'd like to hold President Trump accountable for uh, refusing to relinquish his hold on the uh, White House. We need to start there, but uh, you know, how can we hold these elected officials? We got to vote them out. We got to vote them out. That's the only way. You know, like uh, the Republicans, they're fighting for two, two, two seats in Georgia and, and another state. The, the the Democratic people got to get down there and do their job the same way that they did for uh, the vice uh, president and the vice president. We got to vote them out. That's the only way that you can hold these elected officials accountable. Get them out of office. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that um, I want all the young voters out there to know is that elected officials will cater to the people that, that votes for them. If you got a strong voting block, and as, as uh, the senator just said, and they're afraid of losing their seat, then they will definitely do what you ask and you, and you can hold them accountable. So it's important to understand that um, you, know, you come together, if, if, you, if, if you have a cause that you're really passionate about, then you get a bunch of people that think like you, and then you approach that elected official and you say, listen, we all voted for you and we will vote you out, all right? And that's how we're gonna hold you accountable. I like what somebody else said, run against them too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't forget, I mean, you know, when you think about, when you think about one of the things we covered was AOC and AOC, how she defeated Joseph Crowley, who was like the, the major in the Democratic Party, but she was frustrated with what she saw. She ran and she won. So never discount running and running on your platform and running on your beliefs. And you know, Dan, that, that, you know that's a great point because right now we have some great young individual who just got elected. Um, we got Richie Torres who just got elected. We got Jamal Bowman who just got elected. Uh, there's another young black gentleman who just got elected. I can't remember his name. You know, Jamie may know his name. But um, hey, listen, we got our people are in there, you know, so now is our, is our chance to hold them accountable because they're right here for the BCC district. Of course. Uh, thank you all for answering that question. We have one more uh, last question, unfortunately, from the audience. Um, 
if it, um, all unanswered questions will be uh, sent to the panelists uh, ASAP and they'll, um, I'll make sure to email y'all the answers to that questions. But now to the last um, question uh, from Jalisa Dominguez. What do you think about reparations for slaves? Uh, wow. I, 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 I guess you mean, what do we think about reparations for, for black people? Because you know, we're not slaves. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the whole reparation, there's no doubt in my mind that a lot is owed you know, to the, the Africans, African Americans, the Latino Americans, all those who ancestors were enslaved. Um, how you get that, those reparations to us in what way, in what manner has to be figured out. But I definitely believe that there should be some sort of reparation. And, um, but the big question is how do you, you make that happen? So I wanna jump in. Um, I am, I am working on my, my, I work, I'm in a master's program and my major is higher education. And um, in one of my classes, this subject came up. We talked about um, one college in particular who um, on, that, on that specific college campus where um, there was a bunch of slaves that were sold off and there was some agreements that was made um, and, and those agreements weren't kept. And, and I'm, I'm going to try not to get into such a long story. The bottom line is those agreements weren't kept um, and the some some of the school's um, professors tracked down some of the the uh, relatives of those slaves and the reparation was to allow them to um, to go and to attend that specific college um, without paying tuition. So I, I, I thought, you know, in my opinion, at first I thought it was a good idea, you know, that was one way. But what if what if the what if the there's more than one uh, student in that family that wants to attend college? Do you determine that one student go or or um, both students can go? Um, and how do you know that these students, um, when they do the application process, is there a way to determine um, who these, these students are um, as relatives to these former slaves? So I, I definitely thought education could be one way to go. I just wouldn't know how to implement that. Um, and I don't know if that's something for everybody. Not everybody wants to go to college. I think everybody should try it, but not everybody wants to go to college. So how do you um, make amends for those people who don't want to go to college? And so I definitely feel like education is one way, but I really don't know how to implement that. Well, you know, when the proclamation said that uh, 40 acres in a mule, I don't think you're going to get that. So, you know, like Samika is saying, what, what, what is the reparation? What do we, what do they give us? Uh, it's a question I can't even answer. I'm sorry. Well, I know one thing that this, you know, this country's wealth is built on land. And the reason why it was put in 40 acres is because it's about land. The people that came to this country, right, who were not, who not, who were not brought in to be slaves, mm -hmm. all those people were given land. Mm -hmm. And from that land, Into they have servants. created, they have created wealth you know, for their families, right? So even today, we know that owning property, owning land will definitely help you and your family, right? Uh, you know, build generational wealth. So, um, you know, Senator, you hit it right on the head. You said they promised us 40 acres and a mule. We don't want the mule, but <laughs> if we could get 40 acres. 40 acres. <laughs> Right, we can get 40 acres because it's all about the land, land, land. That's what this country is built on, land. And these people have come over, immigrants have come over and gotten land, free land. And we've gotten, we've got nothing. So uh, I think I'm gonna end on that. I wanna thank everybody out there. Cause I'm, I'm quite sure Gabe is about to close this down. So just wanna thank everybody out there. And thanks for inviting me to do that. I thought, I thought my panel day was over, but you dusted, <laughs> you dusted me off. <laughs> You brought me back, so I want to thank you guys for, for bringing me back. And uh, 
I, I'll see you guys later. I want to um, close this with a few important words. Um, if you have to say, please, it will mean a lot to me. Uh, a big warm thanks and virtual embrace to the panelists for accepting my offer to hop on this platform. Your views and stories were nothing but insightful and inspiring. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have organized this special event without the assistance of the BCC Student Government Association, who I would call my extended family. Our superb advisor, uh, Tiffany Dubon, Associate, De Associate Dean of Student Development, Dr. Manny Lopez, Di Director of Government Relations, Mr. Uh, David Levers for successfully and contacting, connecting with Council Member Gibson, uh, the communications team, Richard Ginsburg and Naomi A. Michelin, and professors and organization leaders for informing their students about this panel discussion. Before I close this wonderful event, I want to share, you know, a few personal words, like I said before. Uh, take action. I think it's imperative for a community with a rich diversity of different ethnicities, religions, sexual orientations, race, culture, and so on to take action in NYC. We must help ourselves and or others who are eligible to register to vote, um, pay attention to the upcoming 2021 local elections and the mayor election coming up. So everyone take pay attention, you know, pick your candidates. Uh, take advantage of the resources BCC offers, uh, like our panelists have listed, like, you know, NYPERG, uh, attending as fun SGA meetings, uh, which you could contact us at SGA at bcc.cuny.edu to learn more and et cetera. Please take this discussion as an inspiration to demand action in the local community. Start by going to the Social Justice Network and Social Justice Action Committee's re-entry, removing the stigma of incarceration event taking place today from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. with panelists from Future Now, uh, the Vera Institute of Justice, and Neighborhood Benches, all organizations that provide resources for those released from incarceration. Thank you so much, and please attend it if you can. I know well. So uh, I want everyone to have a great day. Thank you so much for attending. Um, it really means from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of everyone from the SGA's heart that all y'all intended. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Darren, great job, Darren. Great job once again. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, it was a pleasure. So we come to the end of our Black Lives Matter event. Thank you all so much. It wouldn't have been a success without you. And um, we thank you for engaging and listening. And we know that you leave here very informed and ready to take on action. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Uh, do the host leave or, you know, that, that means everyone leaves, right? Like, it makes sense. <laughs> you have to stay to the end. Gabriel, mm -hmm. yeah. well done. Well that, done, uh, good people, senators, well done. But Gabriel, I'm happy for you, I know. It worked out, Priscilla, very well done. <sighs> Damn. Priscilla, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I'm, I'm, uh, I just wrote to Gabriel to see, um, you, there, you mentioned uh, Gabriel, a panel at two. Um, Gabriel is our legal legislator for the Student Government Association. Right, and there's a panel. So the question from Sarah was about the next discussion. Right. Oh. Uh, is that a separate um, link, Zoom link that you could put in the chat? It looks like Sarah might want to join. Thank you, Manny. Yes. I guess oh. we'll have to email it to them. I think I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not, I didn't RSVP for the, the event, but I, I think once I do that, I'll send it over to y'all. ASAP. Uh, do you all have Sarah's information? Yeah, I, I do have Sarah's information. All right. You'll meet um, one of our former senators there as well, who's on the panel. So 
I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mani. Be Thank well. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll head over to that uh, thing right now. See y'all. All right. Bye. Good afternoon. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Gabe. Bye. Peace.